here with Jerry Payne, uh, excuse me, Jerry McCarthy. Um, uh, today is August 20, 30th, 1997, and uh, let's get started. Um, first off, what, uh, what division were you in? I was in a 12th Armored Division. Okay. Um, and when exactly, when were you born and where? I was born in uh, New York City in uh, 1926. Okay. And what were your parents like? Tell me a little bit about your father. My father, um, well, he, oh, Oh, I don't have enough to hook on to. Maybe we can Do you mind? Dip it and put it on. Oh, oh, oh. Perfect. Uh, yeah. Okay. As long as the technician is okay with him. Okay, let's start again. Tell me a little bit about your father. Well, he um, was a veteran of World War One, and he was um, not in the same sector that I eventually wound up in. Uh, he was in the service when he was 18 years old, and when uh, he came home, he worked for um, Ford Motor Company for a while, and then in Kearney, New Jersey, and then eventually he became a New York City fireman, and uh, retired uh, 20, some odd years, 22 years, I think it was, of service. At that time, he had, in a fire, he had, um, a serious uh, happening with a with a, one of his eyes, and it uh, he was blind in one eye actually when he passed away. Um, from what I understand, as a younger man, he was a pretty good ball player. <laughs> he was born and brought up in um, Lower Manhattan, New York, and uh, in the same locale, uh, my mother. Was, came from the same locale as far as that's concerned. And her father was a, uh, a letter carrier for, at that time. My father's father was a New York City policeman going, going back in the uh, 1800s, uh, late 1800s and so forth. Um, he never retired. Uh, he retired from the police force, but then he same week almost, he became a court officer and worked on until he was about 74 years of age and he worked for within one week of when he died. Wow. And my mother's father worked in the post office for 42 years until they forced him out of the post office. He was 70 years old, I believe. Hmm. And um, my mother... Um, I don't remember, you know, any particular thing. She had as, uh, as much schooling as people could have in those days coming along. Um, she worked at a, um, a number of different jobs, one of them being for um, the Loft Candy Company. And um, she was the uh, handled... Um, the routine for the um, the executive lunch uh, dining room there for the boss for the president of the company for a while and then I, and then as my brother came along and I you know I came along or uh, he settled down to uh, run a home and see that we were kept under control and educated and so forth. Uh, she had a pretty good singing voice. Uh, she used to sing um, in her, from I guess from grade school time, and in the parish that they lived in, they always put on uh, uh, musical shows and so forth. Uh, she then project herself out, you know, too forward about her talent, um, in that she did get a couple of requests if she was interested in doing this to be pushed along, but she did. But anyway, she was a homemaker, you know, and saw that we uh, were taken care of growing up as kids. So uh, there were just the two of you? 
two of you? Yeah, I have an older brother who's still alive. What did your um, father think of, what was his thoughts on uh, the World War I? We never talked about it. I never heard him talk about it. He never sat down with me. There are some other aspects of that situation where um, he wasn't around. So um, we weren't close, let's put it that way, and leave it that way. Okay. Um, was your brother involved in World War II? Yes, he was, near the tail end of it. Um, he, he went into service uh, late. Uh, in that he had a deferment, you know, in college. And um, actually, by the time he took his basic training and arrived overseas, uh, it was the end of the war. But he, he had been in a number of, of bases in the, in the country uh, before he went over and after he came back. You know, he had been around in more places than I had been as far as uh, installations, army installations were concerned. And then he was discharged before I was. <laughs> Came in after I did and discharged before. So how was he involved? Where was he at? Oh, he, um, I guess he spent most of his time in Germany. And um, a bit of the occupation period. Um, I've been trying to think of, he was in small towns, but I, I think one of them like being near Frankfurt, Germany, uh, and he had a, um, an administrative type uh, job, and um, I don't know, he, he did utilize his, his off time uh, to uh, see the uh, uh, historic things in Brussels, as, as he told me. Well, that was one of his trips. Uh, they, was, they were day trippers then, you know, I'd say, you know. And, it, and I've forgotten uh, what else. You, know, you remember him telling me? But he, I know that he, uh, he was a student and he was interested in history. He already knew a lot. He could speak French. He could speak German. And... Um, Italian for that matter, and uh, he he could go to certain places um, like um, the colleges or uh, a parish, you know, and talk to a priest in his in his own language and so forth, and and find out, you know. He knew where he was. I mean, from his previous studies, when he was in a country, he knew exactly like where he wanted to go, and he knew where he was and what he wanted to see there. He was that, that type of person. He became a teacher, came home, taught philosophy in Seton Hall University for a while. And then when he settled in <clears throat> Levittown, Long Island, he became a chairman of the English department for the high school. And um, he had received his master's degree in uh, Romance Languages from Fordham University. And he did study his do for his, document, document, his doctorate for a while. Uh, but things, the burden was, was too much. He was, you know, getting older as all this was going on. And it was a, too much going on in his life at one time. But he did get pretty much down the road on it. Too bad. Other than that, I don't think I can tell you too much about him. Otherwise, we always got along, if you want to put it that way, as far as family, you know. Uh, we're always there, you know, for one another. So what, um, what education did you have before the war? Not much. I was 18, and... Um, I left high school before I graduated. I love, and I still had to complete it when I when I came home. But i in a way, you might say that um, 
I was afraid I wasn't going to get into this. <laughs> I wasn't going to get to the war. <laughs> and uh, of course, being 18 at that time, we, we naturally had a lot of reports in the newspapers. We pretty much knew what was going on in a, in a big picture way in the Pacific and in, in Europe and what had what had gone on, I mean, from the original uh, attack by Germany, you know, on France and on uh, Poland and so forth. I mean, I knew pretty much of that when I, when uh, back in uh, 19, what was it, 41, 42, 43, you know. It, uh, I was, I mean, I don't know if anybody else around me was, but uh, in school we didn't particularly sit around and discuss it. I don't remember the teachers discussing it either, you know, on a daily basis, except that, except that we should keep our, our eye on the goal as far as being a student and uh, not to worry too much, you know, about the, uh, the world situation. But most of my buddies that were uh, 16, some 17, uh, with their parents' permission, and some parents were very happy to sign them on, were gone, you know, into the Marine Corps. A lot of them were gone in the Navy. Um, I wasn't able to get into either or, nor was I going to be signed in. But uh, I used to go down to the Navy recruiting office every once in a while, you know, and they would say, just turn me around, push me out again, you know. <laughs> they they just weren't they really really weren't uh, taking people just because they said they wanted to go at seventeen you know so uh, when it came up uh, for the army uh, there was no problem I mean I turned eighteen I went down and told them I want to go and they said okay and I was in so. If you want, to, want me to tell you where I started, um, was uh, called Camp Upton, Long Island. And uh, that today is the National uh, Laboratory, the Atomic Laboratory. You know, that, that's where the cyclotrons are and so forth. The physicists from all over the world are there. Well, that was a that was a reception camp, and um, from there, after a week or ten days, you were shipped off. In my case, it was shipped off to Fort Dix, New Jersey, and um, I had an interesting job, though. I mean, uh, the first part of uh, of Camp Upton by keeping my mouth shut that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a carpenter and I wasn't a plumber and I wasn't, I had no administrative training and any other particular type of craft, I just stood there and I didn't open my mouth. As the sergeant said, who is, and those people were assigned to some of the most ridiculous jobs, you know, in the world. So. <laughs> When it got down to whoever was left, and I was one of them, and he said, well, okay, we got a job down in the bank for you. <laughs> so we have report, you report to the bank, you know, at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, and I'm on, a, on a, you know, Camp Upton. I know where northeast, south, and west is, but I don't know where the buildings are or anything else, but you report there as if I was an old-timer, you know, hanging out, waiting for, to, for an assignment. But I went down to the the orderly room and I looked at the local map on the board and so forth and then I walked over to the bank and then I walked over to there and I sat down in a small lobby and uh, eventually um, a, a sergeant showed up and most of the most of the people there at that particular time were uh, Air Force veterans. They had been over. They, a lot of them had been wounded, and they they had administrative type jobs mostly, you know, in, in in handling the operation of the base. 
of course, that was Army Air Force, you know, it was all one family as far as branches of service are concerned at that time. And um, he said, what can I do for you? I said, I don't know, sergeant sent me down here. I'm still in civilian clothing. I haven't been issued a uniform yet. And I got a big tag hanging down my front here that, said, that says who I am, so I won't forget, and, and where I belong. I didn't know what the area was, but I mean, it probably had, you know, like B84 dash something or other. If anybody found me, at least they could, you know, call up the local dog pound, you know, and send me home. But uh, he said, uh, yeah, I, you're, okay. He says, you're supposed to have an assignment down here, right? He says, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I'll get a duster. You can dust the shelving off, <laughs> sweep the floor, and polish the water cooler. And he says, have coffee. And um, when you're finished, he said, just let me know you're going. So I said, fine. So I read the newspaper for a while. It was out there in the lobby. And then I cleaned everything off that didn't need cleaning because it was all polished and everything, you know. Water cooler looked great. And I left about 10 o'clock in the morning. And I took myself a walk around Camp Upton. And I watched, I watched the ball teams playing and uh, since people standing online <laughs> you know, outside of buildings and things like that. I just walked around. Nice sunny day. And uh, eventually I went back to uh, the area where I was assigned to because I figured that's where the mess hall was and I'd get something to eat. And the next morning I went back to the bank again, you know, and dusted the shelves. <laughs> <laughs> swept off the floor. <laughs> it was still spotless. And I, I, don't, I don't know whether it was the third or the fourth morning, the first sergeant uh, said, um, uh, today he said you're going to be um, a messenger. Okay? As a report to building so-and-so, which was the unit orderly room. And finally, I, I, I got a big, big envelope and said, take this up to post headquarters. And I said, sure, where is it? So, oh, okay, that's right, you wouldn't know where post headquarters is. I said, no. Well, let's go outside. And when I went outside, I said, take this bike. It was a big balloon tire bike and had a big basket on the front and I put the material in the basket and um, I were beginning to point this direction and then you go that direction and so forth and I took off and this, this bike was a real dud because you could hardly pump it you know but I, I, I worked it out and I found my way up to the, the headquarters and walked up and there was somebody up there that was doing the receiving and I gave it a thing and they punched in a time on it and said uh, we have nothing going back so I went out and I got my bike and I walked alongside of the bike and I went down and I watched the ball games <laughs> that were going, the ball games used to be going on all the time, so it was softball or hardball or whatever and people standing outside of buildings in line and eventually I got myself back at lunchtime, you know, to go to the mess hall. And I did that, I think, for two days. And then they wanted to do something with us as a group, and that was to issue uniform. And then we finally received uh, suntans. And, of course, the rumor went around right away, gee, they're going to issue you suntans here, that might mean you're going to go out to the Pacific. Well, I said, it's August and it's hot, 
and the army wears suntans in August when it's hot, at least. But the suntans, you know, were no bargain. They kept, uh, you know, a lot of the heat in, I think. Um, and so you had a uniform and a pair of boots. Okay, well, we wore um, the um, high, high uh, type shoes. Uh, they were made by Endicott and Johnson. They were, they were really fine shoes. And um, I think we received uh, some fatigue uniforms at that time. And um, was getting close now to begin to give us more OES orientation. And then they said we were going down to take the, um, the general service tests sat through five hours, I believe, of that. And I think of maybe as a following day, we were taken down to the medical people and they gave us the World Series of Shots. Where, you know, some, this is where some people don't survive. They, they fall out the front door and down the steps. And I didn't have any problem with that. But that night in the barracks, I remember somebody uh, having a uh, very bad reaction to the whole thing, and they had to cart them away. And the tough part about that is, you know, everybody was sleeping, and then this fellow was banging his head off the wall and and yelling and screaming and so forth, and uh, they got somebody to take him away. I never did get back to the bank. I never did get back to being a messenger again because they, they finally decided that we were going to be shipped off the four off Fort Dix. And <clears throat> at Fort Dix, I mean, actually, is, is more reception, indoctrination. And then I think we went to Fort Meade, Maryland. And um, at uh, Fort Meade, there was more issuing of, of clothing. Um, uh, oh yeah, that, that's where the, the stenciling party went on, where you stenciled uh, your name and your serial number on, on your, um, all your uh, web equipment, you know, on your duffel bag, and um, counted and it was recounted in the barracks. And the barracks uh, had like twice as many men, you know, bunked than it was actually called for. Um, yeah, that was another funny thing. When they, when they assigned you to KP, they would tie uh, a white towel, you know, around the end, end of your bed. And uh, they had double, double deck of beds, and they had beds, though, down the aisle. That's how crowded it was. But I had a, I had a single bed down the aisle, and uh, about maybe it was five, five o'clock in the morning, uh, somebody came into the barracks and said, okay, up and at them, let's go. And I said, I don't have to get up and at them and let's go. And the fella came back, you know, down and he said, I said, up and at them, let's go here. I said, I am not on the KP list. And with that, he picked up, he picked up the end of the bed and he was about to dump me when I jumped out of the bed and picked it up and threw it at him. And I said, is there a white towel on the end of that bed? And he said, no, he says, that is a mistake. Now, this guy was a corporal, but he had an awful lot of power in those days. You know, they, uh, when they entered, you know, your presence and so forth, you genuflected. Yeah. So, he said, no, that is a mistake. And I, I said, I don't appreciate getting thrown out of bed. I said, when I don't have to. And I said, I really don't like to throw things at people either. He said, he laughed. He says, okay, you're okay. 
So when I wasn't picked for KP after that, uh, maybe because uh, you know alphabetical order and they passed over me for whatever reason or something, I don't know. But uh, that was you know an amusing in incident you know that happened. And then um, oh yeah, we were, were constantly inventorying you know your socks and your shirts and uh, and uh, stenciling and. God knows what. Um, oh yeah, they showed you how to make a bed, how to put the army corners, uh, the hospital corners in and so forth. And this was done, you know, at all hours. I mean, it just seemed to go on and on and on, you know. And then finally, they said, um, okay, it looks like everything is pretty well up to snuff, so there'll be passes issued uh, on this particular afternoon, late afternoon, there would be passes issued. You go to you go to Washington D.C. <clears throat> or go to uh, Baltimore, Maryland, provided that your hair was cut and it had to be cut short. Now they weren't cutting hair short themselves. They weren't coming in. You know, like you see the pictures in the. The routine pictures over the year, everybody seems to be going through and being sheared, you know. And, no, that, that didn't happen, not in my case, or anybody that I was with at that time. But I had to make sure that the, the hair was short enough for the first sergeant's, you know, satisfaction. So a, a fellow I met from Oyster Bay, Long Island, uh, we became sort of buddy-buddy. I said, well, there's only thing, one thing we can do, Ed. You, you cut my hair and I'll cut yours. Make sure. So we cut one another's hair and then his, his cousin was with him also. So we made a, a round of cutting hair that afternoon. And it was short enough and we got a pass. So we went to Baltimore. Out the back gate and went downtown and went to a, a place that had was serving steak, and it was the first, you know, what you would say, good meal, you know, in a while. I, I, I had no problem with what was being served, I mean, already, you know, that, there was no problem with that. Uh, and then uh, we were shipped to Camp Kilma, New Jersey, and, um, and there we were issued weapons, uh, the M1 rifle. And uh, we weren't is issued ammunition or anything like that, but we got the weapons, and then we were only there maybe maybe two days. And that, that's all they did, because Kilmer was now the final staging area. There was no turning back, as it was. <laughs> and... Um, at this point, I, you know, we're going to be sent off, you know, to training areas. So, they um, eventually got us down to the railhead, and I was shipped off to Fort McClellan, Alabama, for my infantry basic training. There was another indicator there that <laughs> this was infantry, so it meant that's where you're going. It looked pretty good. And at that my time of entering the service, um, there wasn't much need, you know, for training ordnance or engineers or signal, uh, what we used to call all the spare part branches, because they, they needed infantrymen. And um, there was not much hope, you know. You were either going to go to a tank school. Very few people went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma for artillery. And uh, the infantry training uh, bases were loaded with people uh, just for that purpose. To turn them out every, what was it, four months, they would turn out thousands of people. I mean, a basic riflemen. But you would you were trained in um, you know the 30 caliber machine gun. You were trained in a mortar 
you would train uh, train with a bazooka. You would train with a with a BAR, um, and then of course uh, all the other tactical aspects of handling that with sections and squads and so forth. And um, I think it was about maybe maybe three weeks into training at the most I was made a, an acting sergeant we used to call them acting gadgets uh, and they put three stipes on my arm and I was treated um, as if I was a full-time uh, NCO which meant that I didn't have to uh, pull details accepting sergeant of the guard that's different but I didn't have to do um, uh, KP for instance and there was table waiter you know was, an, was another one the table waiters you know used to wake up just as early as the KP people because they had to go down to a distribution point <clears throat> to get the ice for the mess hall uh, and get uh, the milk. The milk would deliver in, you know, tall uh, containers. You know, the uh, uh, what are they? Steel, uh, you know, aluminum or stainless steel, you know, containers. And they, you took a, a big wagon and pushed it <laughs> down to pick this up and bring it back. And um, Waiting on tables, you know, meant that you would just uh, get the uh, the dishes for the table. Well, you had to line up things on the, the plates and the cups and the nice forks and spoons and all that on the, the table in the mess hall. And the way that was done, uh, because they had to be absolutely straight, X number of inches from the corner of the table and the space in between, and it was four people on each side of the table so we <clears throat> one one individual would get down the far end of the mess hall and hold the string and you took the string back and it was taut absolutely and that string and you know, would cut the top of the cup right even and then the knife fork and spoon was put out and so forth and then you had to do all that you know and um, if, the, if there was a ketchup or mustard or things like that, the condiments, other condiments, you know, that's on the table. So when the inspecting officer came in, he could look right down that line and, and see if everything was ship shape. And, um, well, I had to pull that once. And uh, the second time it came around, this was before I was, I was made an acting sergeant, when it came around the second time I gave five dollars to somebody else and he pulled it for me. So, it, uh, so I had a day off then in camp because the first sergeant uh, thought I was on detail, but I, I was actually there and another guy was pulling my detail for five dollars. Of course, I might have been doing something else, which I did later on for you know for a dollar, even after I was a I was made a squad sergeant actually. So occasionally, for a dollar or two, you know, I press fatigues. <laughs> so, uh, and then and then we you started off um, uh, September, October, November into December. Uh, basic training. It was finally completed and the Battle of the Bulge was raging in Europe and uh, actually our training had been cut I think by two weeks almost when that happened because they they were calling for people to leave leave the country and start filling the uh, the units in Europe. And of course we weren't happy to see the headlines you know, that thing's going downhill, and uh, here we go. We're, we're ready. And uh, there was no turning back. Uh, 
I would say that the training was top notch. It was very thorough. I was treated well. Uh, it was treating it, you know, uh, like you understood. You didn't have to be taken by the hand and so forth. You were well led by the cadreman. And my experience was seen to be a heck of a lot better than I heard stories of others or those who preceded us in 1943 and 1942. Uh, but the infantry replacement training camps all had the same doctrine to go by. The officers were, were very good and uh, actually we didn't see, see those people very often because they had a, um, a, a massive training staff, the teachers, you know, the instructors. So they, they people assigned of authority to a company were mainly administrative, you know, to see that you got to where you were supposed to go and then there was always somebody else, you know, to, to take over and put you through. We went through some pretty pretty rough training if, if you were not in shape when you, when you started. I mean, you would be when you finished it, but it was a heck of a lot better. And I, I was in very good shape when I started. I mean, I, I could you know, handle the weight of my body, which was maybe 160 some odd pounds at that time. Um, I went through all the physical things with no problem whatsoever. And I, I had no problem on the 25 mile march. In fact, I carried, uh, in addition to my own weight, I carried uh, the weight of, of uh, two other weapons because uh, some of our fellows were having a problem and we didn't want anybody to drop out so we tried to ease up on the on their weight because we were carrying full packs and everything and we went up over a mountain in Alabama it's called Baines Gap and uh, that was part of the 25 miles and that was uh, a, a little about eight hours And we literally, we were wa marching from maybe 8 o'clock in the evening until, um, oh, I don't know, we pulled in maybe about 2 o'clock in the morning, somewhere around there. And as far as I'm saying, you know, for, for your morale, uh, when we came into the, our um, immediate uh, area in cantonment, the, uh, the mess sergeant had um, something for us to eat, you know, coffee and cake and so forth, and then uh, they were going to let us off then until 10 o'clock the next morning. And that was big, you know, that was really something. You know. uh, in plain physical, physical uh, exercising and training would, would happen a number of times during a day. Because uh, before breakfast, they, might, they would take you down to the, the blacktop and um, with, with your uh, M1 and full pack or light pack, combat pack or whatever, you know, and you, and you would start running around the perimeter of that blacktop until they figured you had enough. And then you would come back and have breakfast, and you had breakfast at about between a half hour and 45 minutes, that's what they gave you. So it was really in and out of the mess hall and back. And of course, you had to remember not to mess up. I lived in a hut, what they call a six-man hut. I didn't live in a big barrack uh, like a lot of other people did in different camps. They had them at McClellan, but where my training company was assigned to what they call six-man huts. So. When you left, everything was in ship shape, you know, the floors, and these weren't easy places to maintain. But you had to be careful. In fact, we got to the point where only one individual out of the six would go into the hut and get something for somebody else, so there wouldn't be too much tracking.
And I had, I had the job of checking two other huts where the men in the platoon, uh, men in the, uh, my squad were sleeping because I had to check, check their bunks to see there was A-OK. -okay and and uh, before we left, because when you came back, if the bunks weren't up to snuff, uh, there were gigs. Um, the bunk would be ripped apart and things like that. Fortunately, I had worked it out uh, with my people, you know, that this did, this did not happen. And um, they used to crawl around, you know, underneath. The, the huts were up on cinder block, and um, they would crawl around underneath the hut, you know, to see if there was any dirt and things like that. Some clowns would, that smoked, you know, would put the cigarette through a knot hole in the, in the floor. And of course that wound up on the ground under the hut. And that was a no-no. And the, the matches went down there. And it's the same as some, some people would put the Coke bottle up in the rafter, you know, where you could reach down. There was like a little shelf, you see, and the roof came this way, you know, and there was a space up there that, for whatever reason, they couldn't put the Coke bottle someplace else or the, I don't know about beer cans then, but uh, I had to go up and I had to reach around in there to see if, you know, old socks or whatever was up there. That had to be cleaned out because when the inspecting officer came through, he got up on a foot locker and he, and he looked in through, through there. So. There was only one time that I thought maybe we weren't going to make it, but we were well into the training cycle, and we were running a little bit behind this morning because uh, maybe the, a night problem, and we didn't have much sleep, and by the time we got up and, and got moving around, the time to, be, to fall out for the formation of the day and, and be take off, there was going to be an inspection before we left. So the guys were rushing around and were trying to do the best that they could and so forth, but I looked around and I said, boy, I don't think we're really going to make the standards this morning. And um, I said, however, I have an idea. Knowing the platoon uh, leader, the second lieutenant, just knowing a little bit about what I felt the type of an individual he was. Number one, I knew that he liked, liked music and uh, he liked uh, people in show business and he played the guitar. Didn't play it for us, but I mean, I found out these things, you know. And, and I had a friend that worked for 20th, 20th Century Fox at the time in New York City, a fellow I went to high school with, and um, he sent me all the glossy shots, publicity shots, from the uh, studios in Hollywood of all the starlets, all the big stars, pinups. You know. And I had these, uh, you know, under my mattress because it was a long, thin cotton, you know, like that. And um, I said, you got to agree with me, but this is what we're going to do to get this guy's mind off, you know, a real strict inspection this morning. I said, we're going to put these up. The guy said, well, you're not allowed to put them up. I said, did you hear me? He said, you got to go with me, not against me. I said, put one up there and one up there and put one on the pillow of your bed and so forth. So we spread them around on the six beds. And when he came in, I brought them to attention. And he started looking around, you know. And he said, uh, who owns these? I said, I do. He says, who do you know? Oh, I said, I have a contact. I have friends in 20th Century Fox. He says, woo. He said, I'll be back. 
and he flew out the door and he went up the street and I could hear him boom da boom da boom you know double timing his inspections up the street and he comes flying back and he comes in and he sits down on the bunk and I have about a hundred and some odd of these glossy shots and he's looking through and of course there are some doubles there and I said uh, you want one or two I said uh, you can have it I can I said yeah you can have it I have doubles I said if I need more I said I'll make contact New York City and I'll send them down Oh, he says, gee, that would be great. So I said, just help yourself. So we did. And he thanked us and so forth, and he left. So it was the end of that, and, you know, day of inspection, no gigs, so forth. So then we, whatever the training day was, we went out about our business. Well, and, uh, what training did you did you feel was really helpful over in the war? Well, actually, it was learning, you know, to take care of yourself and how to work with uh, a group. How, in my case, I was, I was expected to automatically be able to lead 12 people. And um, I had an assistant squad leader. But I, I had, I, you know, I had to learn and apply uh, leadership right away and take care of them. You know, I had to, I had to see, you know, that, that their uniforms and their web equipment and everything was clean and they turned out, you know, to my satisfaction, let alone the, the cadre satisfaction. In addition to, because when you were appointed, see, there was, um, what was it four, four squads and there was a platoon platoon leader so the, in each each platoon you had you know four eight twelve temporary appointments and so we took additional training at night time so we could be ahead of our own people you know on the weapon that was going to be taught tomorrow so I, I fell into that sort of thing I don't know why it, it could be one possibility when they went through the records and, and found that, that um, in high school um, I, I um, helped the coach coach the track team. I mean, after I had left my freshman, freshman year and I indicated to my health ed you know, coach, if I could be an ass of assistance and so forth, and he said, sure. He says, what I would like you to do, you know, was in the spring, he says, start working with the, uh, the freshmen when they, you know, when they come on the team. And of course, that went on my record. And of course, when they asked me, the same as you asked me, the questions and so forth, they said, I put that down. So the only thing I can figure is that that made us show, you know, some leadership. And, um, where were we? <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, but you, you had to become proficient, you know, with all the, all of the uh, equipment, you know, all the weapons, you know, uh, to be utilized because uh, you didn't know what combination you were going to wind up with eventually. And then I wound up, I think, in a rather unique situation, uh, uh, being trained as a foot infantry, as we used to call it, you know, the old foot pounder, in an armored division. When I went overseas, I was assigned to an armored division. I mean, I hadn't associated, you know, with all the vehicles and all the equipment on the vehicles and so forth and, and, and how they functioned. But, you know, you, you just kept learning. You know, you just listened, you know, to what was going on. And of course, the, there, the uh, platoon leader and the platoon sergeant and, the, and your squad sergeant and so forth, we were all doing the same thing. You know, take care of you, train, teach you and so forth. So that, was, that was no problem. I mean, you had to keep your eyes and your ears open. I mean, if you were going to know... Uh, if it was going to help you, that's the only way it could help you to mean maybe to survive. So um, I had no problem with that. You know, I wasn't thinking about anything else except uh, doing it, doing the job, being able to do a job, and and not get into trouble 
because I didn't know or I wasn't paying attention. Yeah, I would say that. Let's see, from Dixon, where did you go? From Fort Dix? From Dix, right. Fort Dix, I went overseas on a Queen Elizabeth. Four days and some odd hours. I had a nice trip. I had good quarters <laughs> in comparison to some other people. Did you get sick? No. I mean, that's what I mean. I mean, I didn't get sick. And um, it, well, you know, it just it was no no big deal. I mean, as far as that's concerned, I mean, it uh, wandered all over the ship, pretty much, except the upper decks, which were off limits. But I was on a deck. In peacetime, it was a suite of rooms. We had a lot of people in there, though, you know, six high, and uh, maybe 21 people in one room and 20-some-odd people in the other room. We had a full bathroom, and of course, most of the, most of the people were sick in the room, so they were, they were up in their bunk and their equipment was on the floor. And I put my equipment in, in the bunk and spent the rest of my time wandering around the ship. Or I, I slept I slept in a hall, slept in a, in a lobby, <laughs> you know. And uh, there, were, there were people doing this all over, you know, the ship. There were people uh, sleeping on PX lines. Uh, because you could buy, um, you know, candy and tobacco and so forth, you know, it was like a, like a regular PX, but it would only be open so many hours. So I didn't spend any time on a line. Uh, a buddy and myself, we made up a list of what we wanted. It wasn't a heck of a lot, but I mean, it was just having something extra in your pack. And then we paid another guy to stay on the line. And they, 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 um, they issued a Coca-Cola uh, on the house to each room, each location. I, I don't know how they, you know, where they had the list and all that other stuff, but somebody came in the room and, and said, uh, if you follow, follow me, and uh, we'll go down, you know, and, and get the coke. So before we left, we asked uh, the people in the room if they wanted their coke. And most of the people in, in the room were sick. And they were, when they heard, you know, coke, a lot of them, you know, they, it had an effect on them, you know. And uh, the next room, you know, no, they don't want any coke or anything. I didn't bother to ask the guys that were playing cards in the bathroom if they wanted because they had the door shut. And there was three card games going on in the bed, one in the tub, one, three, three guys standing over the, by the sink and they used to just put a cardboard down or a, or a newspaper or a magazine or something, you know, for a top and then there was one guy at each end of the tub and one sitting on the floor outside. And wherever there was space, you know, there were people playing cards, literally. We didn't bother, bother with them. So we went out, <clears throat> this friend of mine, and we were taken down the aft end of the ship, and we went down on an elevator, and they issued uh, two cartons of Coke. So we promptly uh, took it up, um, I don't know, First, the first deck, you know, where there, where there were troops above the the supply level decks, you know, and the, and the ship, and we put it out in the hall and we sold it for fifty cents a bottle. <laughs> so then we we could go up on the, I think it was an on it back up on the A deck, and went um, back to the stern of the ship uh, in peacetime there obviously had been some sort of a, a lounge and in the lounge they were selling some beer like I don't know 25 cents 
or something for the beer in those days, you know. And I know, so we bought some beer. <laughs> and uh, finally we arrived in Glasgow, Scotland, and uh, oh, incidentally the ship zigzagged all the way across. Uh, there was a tremendous storm, I think, on the second night out where the waves were breaking over the promenade deck. And the, and the ship was go just, you know, going like that, nice and easy, you know. There was about 85,000 tons of ship there. So uh, we arrived safe and sound in uh, Glasgow, Scotland, and they put us on uh, trains, and they took us to Southampton, England. And uh, that was uh, a good 24-hour trip at that time. Uh, the trains had been used, reused, they were, you know, broken windows, and they were compartments, you know, but there were so many people on the train, and everybody with the same amount of equipment, with the duffel bag, and the barracks bag, and the full pack, and the overcoat, and the weapon, and uh, steel helmet, you know, and everything. You carried everything, you know, uh, all your be all your belongings uh, in the world with you, right? And there were people trying to sleep on the floor. It was, you know, a sit-up type of thing, you know, European cars, you know, the, with the compartments. And, of course, the doors were always open. I, 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 don't, I don't remember them. Maybe that they were still there. But a lot of the glass was broken out of the windows, and it was pretty cold out. You know, the train was cold, there was no light, you know, and um, I don't think they, well, I, yeah, I can remember stopping when it was still daylight. I've forgotten whether they fed us or not, uh, but at one station, they had, uh, I don't know, gray ladies or Red Cross or a combination, and they, they were out there with donuts and, and uh, tea. They had big buckets of tea. I don't, I don't remember coffee. Well, by the time we left, we had taken a couple of trays of the donuts with us as we pulled out of the station. And they were pretty well, pretty upset over that as the train was moving and we were saying goodbye and they were yelling, you can't take the trees. And we said, yeah, fine, thanks a lot. We'll see you again. And we pulled out and we had all these extra donuts then. You know. And the people were... Uh, some areas where we passed through, they had uh, apartment houses, you know, that were still standing and people were hanging out from the different floors and they were yelling and, I guess, whatever, Yankee, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we were yelling back the same to you and, hi there, you know. <laughs> and finally we got to uh, Southampton. And... Um, at Southampton, they had an old rust bucket waiting for us to take us across the channel. And um, I don't know how many ships they had because this one ship couldn't handle all of the people that came down on that train. And uh, there were no bunks. It just went down. It was a, a cargo ship and you just went down. I think there were three or four holes on the ship and you, they just sent you down there and you just went on the deck and you picked out a spot and and that was it. Uh, excepting some, somebody came by and said uh, it's time to get some food and he says, so we're great. What do we use? Uh, we take out our mess kits? No, uh, you don't need your mess kit. But he says, you see this, uh, the steel bucket hanging on the post? Says, yeah. And there's a ladle? On the, yeah, okay. Well, take that and follow me. So I think it was two of us that decided to do this because it was something to do and you would see something, you know. While you, while you were taking this tour to Europe, I mean, you might as well do as much as you can, right? So... We went up on deck, walked across the deck, then went down into another hole, and I, uh, they must have, ha they had a big bucket there, and it was, I guess it was oatmeal, 
and the guy reached into the bucket and boom, and filled this up, you know. And you carted this back up and you went back to the hall where you were and you brought it down. Also, they also gave us some bread, uh, like French bread, you know, if I remember. And um, set this bucket down and, and, and said to the rest of them, he said, well, there it is. There's your supper or whatever time of the day it was. I've forgotten now. I said, I guess you break out your mess kit, you want to put it in the mess kit, you know, and eat it, that's up to you. And broke up the bread. And um, I think I, I made a taste of it, I took some of it myself, and then I tasted the bread, and unfortunately the way that oatmeal tasted, the way the bread tasted, is the way the ship stunk. <laughs> it was that bad. <laughs> bad deal. Not going to eat any of this. So, we had some K rations, and then I, I think we maybe broke out a, a K ration. You weren't supposed to break out the K ration until you got to France, and the reason why they gave you the K ration in case things weren't set up in France, you know, to feed you. But I, we went, we broke up the, uh, the ration and ate the crackers or the cheese or whatever was in a particular type, whether it was breakfast, lunch, dinner, you know. And then we found out that they had a PX on the ship, so we went up there to see what they had, and, uh, you know, um, run by, you know, the English and the crew. And um, they had some crackers. Uh, of course, everything made in England. And they had some hard candy, and they had some tobacco and so forth like that. We bought some of that and um, went down back into the hole of the ship and, and stretched out on the floor and, and uh, went to sleep for a while. And somebody else uh, came because we didn't go out in a 24-hour period. We were, we were there about to move whenever they said, I guess, you know, from higher headquarters because I think, I think it was the following day. Somebody came in, and I was I was picked. I don't know why. I'm, I'm I'm no longer an acting gadget. You know, I lost that status when I left the country. And um, took me out and down the gangplank, and said, you know, watch the gangplank and don't let anybody up and don't let anybody off. I did all by myself. <laughs> I and mean, that was it. So there was nothing going on, nothing around, nobody creeping or crawling. But a captain came by eventually, and he was a paratroop captain, told by his uniform, told by his boots. And um, he, I don't know, he said to me, uh, what are you doing out here? And I said, well, I'm supposed to watch and see that nobody gets aboard and nobody comes off the ship. So he says, all by yourself? And I said, yeah, there's nobody else around. Only one way you can go and come, unless you want to jump in the water or something. And so he said, uh, well, he says, I'm down here for a different reason. You know, of course, I asked him, well, you, know, you want to go aboard or something, sir? You know, and he said, no. But he said to me, he said, uh, would you like some donuts? So I said, sure. I'd like to have donuts. And he says to me, well, then come along. I said, where are we going? He says, right in the warehouse on the, on the pier, right across over here. Well, I said, I said, oh, yeah, okay, I guess so. You know, we were trusting. But I left my post in effect, right? Didn't give that too much of a thought, really. And uh, we went into this warehouse and there's tons of donuts that have already been cooked. And it's cold, you know. And he pulls out a tray and he says, here. <laughs> he says, you can take these back to the ship you want, you know. <laughs> so I went back to the ship with the donuts and I went right up the gangway. Went to the hole, you know, and I called down and I said, leaned over with the 
trays, you know, of donuts and handed them down. I said, here, here's a gift, you know. And the captain gave them to me on a pier. <laughs> and, you know, I don't think I was ever relieved from that detail. I don't think anybody ever bothered with it after that. And that was, a, you know, a weird thing, you know. He went his way and I went mine, you know. And um, it finally, in uh, late afternoon, they uh, pulled away and we started out into the channel and arrived in Le Havre maybe 11 o'clock at night or something like that. And they had, like, by that time, they had a steel floating pier and a ship could pull in, actually pull in alongside of it. Four ships could pull in, you know, not big monsters, but fast-sized uh, cargo ships. And um, that was the beach near, near Le Havre, France. And uh, that was an interesting movement getting off the ship because it went almost straight down the gangway, you know, went almost straight down like this. And of course you load it up with the barracks bag, the weapons, the web equipment, the overcoat, the field jackets, you know, and everything that you owned. And blankets, uh, you're somewhere along the line there, yeah, we got extra blankets. So you had four blankets and uh, an extra pair of shoes they had issued, combat boots. And they you had tied those on the back of your, your pack, and that thing was swinging in the breeze. And we had been issued uh, from old style, what we called old style packs that dated back, you know, to 1918 into the new packs, you know, where you could, uh, it was like a box, you know, you could shape it because it had straps a uh, number of different ways, and you had a separate packages on top, uh, which you had know, that zipped on and zipped off, and you could use that as a separate carrying bag too, and you could carry a tremendous amount of equipment there. So we, you know, we're carrying you know 50 pounds plus uh, at that time, plus got to handle this and keep the, keep the M1 on your shoulder and get down this all by yourself. I mean, one at a time. And when anybody fell, it was like dominoes, you know, one guy after the other would, would go, you know, but they weren't too much worried about that. But there were slats, you know, where you could catch your, your heel of the boot. And I mean, if you didn't, I mean, there might be some slipping. And there, there had been stories that I heard where people, you know, slipped through the rail and wound in the drink. Not only there, but in New York, in, in, when they were loading aboard ship. And um, you know, from there that we marched about three miles into the heights uh, outside of La Havre and into a camp. Uh, nicely mudded. They had steel matting down that they used, you know, like in the, in the uh, airstrips. There was steel matting uh, down and there were tents set up, uh, which we used to call squad tent, and that was it. You went in a squad tent, threw your equipment on the ground, and picked out a space and went to sleep. It was cold, it was damp, and uh, pretty muddy, and we were pretty tired. And I remember uh, maybe 7 o'clock the next morning or something, you know. Some people fell out on that march because they, uh, you could feel it being inactive for almost, um, almost three to four weeks after you stopped your basic training. So now you weren't out, you know, moving around as much and so forth. <clears throat> and uh, I remember hearing every once in a while as we went up the cobblestone street up to the top, you'd hear somebody go plop. You know, they knew, and you'd hear the steel helmets, you know, bouncing off the concrete because you knew somebody fell out. But <laughs> that wasn't much of your problem. I mean, you just kept right on going, you know. So, uh, 
stayed up in, in, uh, in the campground maybe two days or so. And uh, there was nothing to do. Nobody bothered you or anything. It was just that you were there and they were just waiting to, to ship you out, that's all. And finally we, we did get a, um, I don't know whether it was a, a hello and a, a welcome and a goodbye all at the same time by some officer who stood up on a stump of a tree and told us, you know, the, where we were going and uh, how, what the situation seemed to be like and so forth and good luck and good hunting and so forth and uh, they marched us back down into Le Havre and we went to the railhead um, and they told us in the daylight now there will be a lot of Frenchmen watching you on the streets they won't be cheering, they won't be waving any flags, and don't make eye contact with them. So we said, why not? He says, because they really don't like us that much. We've, we've uh, moved in here and we bombed their harbors and villages and they, they have a problem understanding this thing totally and completely. It's a great, you know. Well, we went down there and then we were <clears throat> like cattle in a pen and uh, finally they started loading us aboard uh, freight cars and uh, meanwhile searching around the yard before well maybe it was after we had been assigned a, a car a particular car and I, when I say we this buddy of mine we're always the, always together he said well Ed let's go down and wander around the yard before this thing pulls out and see if we can use anything before we go. So um, we found a, a, a trainman's shack, a small shack, you know, and so forth, and it had a small stove in it and had some wicker baskets of coal. And Ed looked at me and I looked at him and then some other guys came along that might have had the same thing on their mind, but we knew them and they were in our car also. And so we took the stove and took the coal and went back to the car with it. And put it on, put it in our car. And then <laughs> when that happened, it's so, at the same time the train started to pull out. We didn't know that, but I mean, it, the timing was just perfect. And we got a, we got aboard and then we could see somebody down there at the shack going out of their mind because he came back from whatever he did, you know, he was only a civilian working the yard. He wasn't in the army, he was a Frenchman that was a, worked in the yards, you know, so. And he realized he was missing something in his shack and so forth and I, we could see him, you know, waving his arms and screaming and so forth and everything, but we were pulling out. And then we set, the, we set the stove up and chopped the hole in the roof of the car, put this pipe up through. And with that wasn't all very keen because later on that night we damn near burned the car down. <laughs> we, we set up a, uh, uh, a watch list amongst all the bodies in the car, which was about 25. Uh, this was much better than as when they carried, you know, prisoners of war and uh, the Germans, when the Germans used the cars that way, or they, they carried all those people that were going to the death camps, you know, they put 50 in them, better, you know, so we had 25. And you just pick out, a, again, you always picked out a spot, right? Like a dog, you turned around twice and it fell down. And with all your equipment and so forth, and. Uh, if you wanted to eat your K ration or something, you could eat. And they, they closed the doors, you know, so you didn't know what was going on. It was pitch black outside, but we fired up this stove. <clears throat> and I remember after I had pulled my watch and I, I went over into the corner of, of the car and I got down and it wasn't easy 
can fall off the sleep because you had this motion going back and forth and back and forth and a rocking and back and forth and rocking and you, you couldn't push yourself on a, on a wall to steady yourself and you couldn't grab anything on the floor. There was no way to, to stop this motion. So it was really, it, it was not easy to go up to sleep, but a lot, a lot of the people did. I must have because I woke up with a start or somebody began to make a lot of noise and when I did I turned around and I see this orange glow you know in the middle of the of the car and obviously it had too much coal it was burning like crazy and there was sparks shooting around the, the roof of the car so somehow and to this day I really don't know how we stopped all this and had to you know get the pipe down you know and cool off the fire and so forth and and stop the the uh, roof from uh, burning but when you look back on it I mean actually what we were saying to the Air Force for one thing is here we are you know if you want to know where we are here we are here's the here's the signal going up but I think that was um, I think it might have been the end of the stove bit but uh, the, I the next night we didn't have it. I, well, we maybe traded it off or put it on a siding or some place. I don't know. <laughs> and, it, and it was getting colder and colder out because as we moved across France, it was the weather was changing quite a bit, and the snow began to appear on the ground, and then we could see it was mounding up as you went forward, you know, the, each village had more snow than the previous village and so forth. And they fed us on the way where we'd stop in a, in a station like Bali Deuce. And they had <clears throat> a system in the middle of the, this wasn't a big station, this was just a small station in, the, in a town on the ground. And the transportation corps who was responsible to see that you got from A to B and all that uh, was handling this, the same as they did like on a ship. That was all handled by the transportation corps. And they actually had uh, paper plates, I think, for us and utensils and so forth. They said it's a hot meal. And uh, that was like a plus. And then uh, I remember in another town, we'd just try to gauge how long you were going to be there. And we would walk around to look at the village a little bit and still have the train in sight. And um, we're looking in, a, in one town, looking in a, a bakery window. And it was just, you know, French bread in the window. And I don't know whether we were debating to go in and maybe, you know, get, buy a loaf or what. And um, a little old woman ran up to us and had a, a loaf of bread. And she just looked at us, broke it in half, gave us one half and ran away. <laughs> you know, we say, lady, we, we don't need this. You know, we don't need this. We're gone as quick as she was there. And then another place... Uh, I remember we had to walk up some steps and uh, we found a place that looked like, you know, cafe and we stopped in and it, it looked very makeshift and there was a ton of GIs in there. Not from the train so much, they, they, they looked like they were stationed there or whatever. And I remember there were a number of paratroopers in there and there was a paratroop officer in there and everybody was sort of mingled together and they were having wine and whatever cognac i guess uh, and so forth and we pop in and, and this officer turned around and, and said uh where are you from you know i said well we just got off the train down there we're waiting to go through he says oh you're pushing on up ahead yeah we're pushing on up ahead uh, <laughs> so he said have a drink <laughs> and he bought us a couple of drinks, wished us well, and we went on our way, you know. As I said to Ed, hey, Europe's not bad, you know. 
<laughs> the, the trip is kind of looking looking up, you know. <laughs> so the next thing you know, we, we heard the, the whistle in town, and we were ready to race back down the stairs, you know. And it began to move out, but we remembered, you know, the number of your car, and we were running alongside and and jumped up into the car and took off. And eventually we I went around Paris and. Well, there was limited, you know, rail lines to travel by because they all had been pretty well banged up and they could only use so much for, you know, freight traffic, troop traffic and things like that. And um, getting over bridges, the existing bridges, and a lot of times there was backing up on sidings at night, you know, and then them being pulled out again and then traveling short distances and stopping. Everything was blackout, you know, the whole thing. There, was, there were no lights, you know, on, a, on the uh, locomotive or anything. That's another thing we did going across. Uh, it, had <clears throat> it had rain and we got wet because we were off the, off the train. So on the way back to the train, I said to my friend, I said, I'm not going back in the car soaking wet like this. I said, but let's, let's go up to the locomotive and, and, and dry off. So we went up ahead of the train and got on the locomotive in the, in the engineer's cab, and we went up there and shoveled some coal into the boiler and uh, dried off. And we waited until the next stop. And we got off and walked back, you know, and, and the guys asked, well, where, where were you fellas? You know, I said, we were up in the locomotive, <laughs> riding across. <laughs> we helped them shovel coal into the boiler. And, um, and then we arrived in uh, somewhere in the vicinity of um, Epinal, France, and the Alsace-Lorraine. Uh, territory and uh, we were in a, a replacement depot and the snow was now really high like hip high and, uh, and it was snowing it was a blizzard going on and uh, they told us that this had been going on for quite a while and uh, might as well get used to it so they had nothing for us to do in particular. We still had our same issue of weapons, and the people that didn't have one, they got, <clears throat> they got a nice present of a brand new weapon that was full of cosmoline, and they had to haul it off to a place they had for cleaning this sort of thing. The only other thing they did was take us out to the thousand inch range to zero in our weapon. And we did that, and then you lock that site at 300 yards, a battle site. And um, they had some place there that uh, they called Radio City, <laughs> and we heard that the gray ladies or somebody, French ladies or whatever, they ran this little club. And this was actually a factory complex, you know, but it had been taken over the quarter troops. I mean, quarter and uh, a lot of troops that were either going or coming. And most of them were going. Or I should say coming. <clears throat> and um, we called out three different times up there and, and turned back three different times because they would only... Uh, uh, call off so many people and but everybody it seemed had to go I, I don't know why but everybody used to have to drag all your equipment with you and so forth out and stand in the snow and if you weren't going you went back to the factory building again and find your uh, canvas cot and sleeping you slept with all your clothing on and uh, it was very cold and uh, I remember there we finally put the overcoat on over the over the field jacket. Yeah, that's how cold it was. So that went on for about three days, I think, and and finally, finally, uh, you got aboard trucks 
uh, I guess they were, yeah, the two and a half ton cargo type vehicles. And they started on a, a long, winding trip. I remember after we got aboard, somebody came around and um, threw up into the back of the truck. I guess there were K rations. And they just came by and, here's lunch. <laughs> and you have break open the, uh, the uh, case of, of rations, you know, and, and hand them out to people. And this thing kept winding and winding up the hills and down hills, and it was looked pretty dangerous, you know, for a driver, you know, going through this. And of course, I, I don't know how they knew where they were going. I mean, people had to learn roads, you know, and real quick, and what villages and towns it was supposed to take people to. <clears throat> and um, it was snowing all this time. It was really coming. There was a lot of evergreen around, and we were pretty high up, I suppose, in the Vosges Mountains uh, surrounding the area. And finally arrived at some village, some French village, you know, where somebody said, okay, get out of here. You know, we jumped out of the truck, stood on the ground, there was somebody else there. That I later found out that was from the 12th Armored Division. And they were at an assembly point, you know, and picked up X number of bodies and uh, went down to another headquarters someplace. And these were all peasant villages now, small villages, you know. That, and in, in the dead of night, uh, assigned to a particular company. I didn't, I didn't know, you know, really where, where I was. I didn't know it was a 12th Diamond Division. And um, I didn't know what battalion. I didn't know what company. Uh, that came very slow, you know, as you began to meet a few people, you know. And finally meet a first sergeant and finally meet, uh, meet a company commander. Uh, and then get a particular assignment and I remember a grouping in a, in a small room. Oh yeah. Well, there seemed to be some activity going on. That's right, before that. Gets days, get uh, one before the other here, but uh, which you, you, you heard about, all about the Hurlesheim experience and so forth. Well, this unit battalion was beginning to pull back, you know, from that. There was a lot of traffic, you know, going on in the area. So as, as we arrived, that's right, but before that, as we arrived, we were sort of like uh, put in with a, a group that was sort of guarding a, uh, a retreat situation. So I said, the first thing I said to my friend McGar, I said, this is great, they're retreating, and we just ar arrived, you know. So that went uh, over for about, a, I think, one night. And <clears throat> eventually we wound up seeing this first sergeant and, f and seeing the captain of the company. And um, sitting on the floor. And they said, the way, way we're going to do this, we need X number of people that can handle this, this weapon, that weapon, the other weapon, and so forth. And if you can do that, you know, just raise your hand. If there's more than one or two or three of you that can do it, get off the floor and the first guys that reach my desk over here will get the assignment. I don't know, are they crazy? But anyway, I sat there and I listened to M1 rifle, machine gunner, and mortarman, and I didn't pick any of them. And then I heard 57 millimeter anti-tank weapon. I got up there, just ahead of another guy, and at the first side, the captain says, okay, uh, anti-tank weapon, 57 millimeter, you know about that? I said, sure do. Never saw one in my life before. 
And it sounded like a decent sized weapon where, uh, you know, people wouldn't necessarily, you know, be on top of uh, the line, you know, like a, a rifleman, a mortarman, and so forth, right? Machine gunners. And I said, okay, and Sergeant so and so, here's a man for you, and picked me up took me down to uh, a schoolhouse where they were quartered and I was in the anti-tank platoon in Company B, the 66 AIB and everybody welcomed me because I was a new warm body and they needed a number of them, right? So uh, I don't know, we were in that building maybe a couple of days. And I think some of the first shots that I heard, I heard artillery uh, go off occasionally. But the one that really got me out of the stack was about 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, somebody had gotten me a sleeping bag, meanwhile. And they had straw on the floor in, the, in this schoolhouse. They had moved you know, the desks out. And everything, and the straw was on the floor. And took, you could take your shoes off. And heard this, you know, loud report, a real cracking, you know, loud report, one after the other. And, you know, you just come bolt up, you know. And I didn't know was that incoming or outgoing. And somebody said, oh, they're going a crazy Frenchman again. And they said, well, wh what's that? You know, I said, well, right short distance down at open field, he says, they have batteries of uh, 75 millimeter w uh, weapons down there. And every once in a while, and usually it's, it's 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, you never know when it's going to be, they get a firing order. And all it takes is for each one of the three guns is maybe fire one round or two rounds a piece, he says it's all over. When it starts and it's all over like that and you won't hear him again. So that's what that is and I think that's was the first uh, weapon that I heard fired, you know, it was in a combat situation, you know. But they, they, and they, and they stayed there, the Frenchmen stayed there and I never saw them move around. And then, uh, we um, we went out on um, what they, I guess sort of like what they call a picket duty on our posts. Uh, we would take the guns out to crossroads and set them up in a uh, defensive uh, position. And then, of course, I was introduced to the half track. Uh, I carried all your uh, necessary equipment. And well, the other thing was that I was I was stripped of all the stuff that I had been carrying from the states because I no longer needed the big uh, combat pack or uh, not the combat pack but I mean the, the sack you know that you backpack that you carried everything I could keep my weapon keep my web equipment it took the overcoat away it took my barracks bag away. I took my duffel bag away, not that I had much in it, uh, left in it, and um, it gave me, um, well I had my combat boots and they gave me special fatigues then that were impregnated for uh, defense against gas. And they gave me a sleeping bag and I kept two blankets and a sleeping bag cover and a seat cushion and that was for the, your, your cushion in the track. That was what you sat on and had, it zipped around and um, you kept extra socks and underwear and air, cards from home, whatever you wanted really. <laughs> um, and then you had your helmet, helmet liner, and you had your beanie, and you had your, your sweater, and, and extra ODs. 
and then eventually we did we switched strictly to OD clothing from the fatigue clothing and your field jacket and eventually uh, later on I had a, a tanker jacket eventually uh, I had uh, waterproof coveralls uh, that were blanket lined and eventually from the boots from the combat boots which you, which you kept you know but switched over to shoe packs the uh, leather bo uh, rubber bottoms and leather uppers and they had a big thick sole in it so you could get around in the snow of course, other than that, you had uh, overshoes, you know, that buckled over your boots, and you couldn't get out of your own way. I mean, you're trying to run with something like that. And that happened, you know, many a time where uh, a position would be attacked and people had to get out, but you couldn't run with the, with the, with the uh, it, would, it was hampering you, actually. So they used to just take them off and leave them. You know, and, and hightail out of a, a hot situation. But with the shoe packs, I mean, you could work it out pretty well all around. Uh, and, and I was introduced, as I said, you know, to the half track and to the 57 millimeter that they towed on the back. And uh, in the half track, you had 100, 100 rounds of 57 ammunition. I had 12 six-pound landmines on the racks outside. You had uh, at least uh, two to three boxes of 50 caliber ammunition because the vehicle had a 50 caliber machine gun on it. You had two to three boxes of 30 caliber ammunition for the M1 rifles. You had carbine ammunition on the track and you had 45 ammunition also because um, we also had what they, you know, called the, the machine gun, the, the grease gun. So, if anything ever hit that thing, it would have been like 4th of July for the next 10 years, you know. And which, when they were hit, this is the way, they went up even sometimes more fiercely than, than a Sherman tank would go up when they got hit. And we had what the pioneer tools on that on the track also, you know, shovels, axes, and so forth. Uh, and of course that was for in case you ever had to, you know, knock down something that was in your way, it would, that would help and, and um, um, build things too. We had a lot of chains on the track. We had um, a cable, a steel cable uh, winch, on the fr winch on the front of the track and that that was used sometimes in a, in a situation where you could pull yourself out of the ditch and um, landmine detector was on there and you carried uh, a case of C rations and probably a, a case of K rations and uh, it depended upon whatever orders were issued, whether you were going to eat the C rations or the K rations. And that used to be determined by somebody, you know, uh, the, the captain or whatever, would tell the, the, the NCO, you know, platoon sergeants and so forth, you know, what to eat and what not to eat, you know. So, and, uh, well, this kind of activity took off of, uh, a number of nights uh, around that period, it was in January, and um, fortunately nothing serious happened. There used to be um, like hurry up calls, emergency situations, you only would be told that there was a, some intelligence of, of a fear of maybe a possible breakthrough in a certain area, and that's the reason why you were being sent there. A lot of times this was not particularly behind your, your own infantry, it was behind maybe uh, another infantry unit from some other division, you know, but you, we were, were like a secondary and, and, and guarding a crossroad, you know. And that would go on every so often. And, 
During the day, there was some training in that what they used to do was um, after action type of thing. After a, pre a previous action, lessons learned. And they would sometimes even go back to the town that they actually fought the initial uh, activity, and that could have only been a short distance away. Uh, you, you were always in close proximity to that front, and what was the front was, was only taken a couple of days ago, so, and, and consolidated and so forth. So the companies could be taken back, and the whole battalions would be taken back, and they would say, okay, now we're going to take this place all over again. And we're going to show what we consider, you know, mistakes that were made. And you kept your ears open to this, which was a lot of good information. And that's like one simple thing, when you would hit the ground, make sure you hit the ground close in to the building as possible because the tile roof would be coming off and if you were out and that tile is falling two stories or so and it would uh, cause great injury, let alone kill you, you know. And also, uh, being careful with uh, your weapon, uh, which you were told in basic training and all that, but I mean, there were certain things that they noticed that individuals were maybe missing, you know, forgetting and so forth. You so were taken all through that again. And it would be go on for a whole day. And uh, at least it, it broke up the monotony because, you know, you're beginning to feel what, what it was to be uh, in a monotonous situation. Because eventually, as time goes on, it, you, you're not quite sure what the, what the day is, and you're not quite sure what the time is, because it doesn't mean a damn thing to you. <laughs> not really. If you want to think about it, I mean, you're fine, you know. But I mean, when, you know, you didn't wake up today and say what day it is, or, or hooray, it's Tuesday, or, you know, going to luncheon today at 12. <laughs> And in a way, I forgot, you know, I asked somebody, you know, is today Saturday or Sunday? No, I think it's Monday. And, you know, really, it was, and, and you had this overcast constantly, it were gray days, you know, you, we weren't looking at the sun. And it maybe it snowed the night before, maybe there was a little break, you know, in the sun in the morning. But then it would be a gloom day again. Uh, so if you're in that type of situation, it's like being in a cell, you know. And it just, it just, you know, went through the motions. If somebody said, well, we're going here, I'll go there, you know, and, and uh, do whatever you, you were ordered to do. Let's uh, go ahead and take a break right now. Why not? Is okay. that all right? Yeah, sure. Okay. I'm ready for a break. I mean. Back with Mr. McCarthy. Um, this is August 30th, 1997. My name is Michelle Colvin, and we are in Columbus, Ohio, with the uh, uh, 12th Armored Division reunion, uh, continuing a, a uh, interview. Go ahead. Um, you know, it was um, around the f the first the first of um, February that. Um, there was a lot of refitting of equipment uh, and restocking of equipment on the uh, on the track and maintenance on the vehicle and things like that nature. And then um, I guess there was an order received uh, to stand by and to move out. You know, it's like move out on 12 hours notice or move out on two hours notice. It could be anything. So you were going to stay right exactly where you were, whatever building, whatever town we were in at that particular time. And then as uh, it became dark that night, the convoy started to move out. Everything, everything was on the road. I found out, I mean, that I belonged to a, a combat command A, and um, nobody really knew, I don't think uh, off the top, 
that the mission was going to be to seal or at least you know help to be sealed off the Colmar pocket. The Germans had been cut off there for many months uh, especially when the Battle of the Bulge uh, happened and the the Third Army had moved north a bit and the Seventh Army took over two army front and the the big picture you know was for the Seventh Army to hold mainly what they call holding attacks and it keeps everybody on the other side off balance and at the same time uh, General Eisenhower had ordered that the Colmar pocket be eliminated so <clears throat> we were placed under um, French First Army tactical supervision and would be committed based on the French general's order. So we were moving at night, or CCA and CCB, CCR, the division artillery, you know, was being placed into position uh, and following on. And uh, by the nightfall, we were actually moving in, into the outskirts of Colmar. Meanwhile, the, the 28th Infantry and the 79th, I think, and the 3rd Infantry and so forth, they were working up in the hills and many other areas, uh, having their hands full to a certain extent. And the French 2nd Armored Division was also in the area, and the rest of the French infantry French Moroccans were, invo were involved. Um, however, we received an order, that, that is, the division as a whole had received an order to move through as rapidly as possible and to hit the town of Rufac in southern France. It's the opposite side of uh, Colmar. And in doing so, we would seal off the exit, the last exit for them to get out, and which we did. And uh, it was, it was for us at that time. It was just a, a race to get there, and if anything was in the way or spotted, you know, it was eliminated. Uh, not much of that actually happened. We, we were fortunate. Some of the other, uh, some of the uh, units uh, and the other combat commands did run into crossroad situations and roadblocks and things that had to be eliminated. And we arrived in uh, Rufak, it was very early in the morning, and uh, they, the Germans were racing up into the hills to get away, and they were racing out of town, they were trying to, you know, get away as many as possible. Some of them had pretty good warning, you know, and did get out of that loop, but I don't know how far they got. They ran into somebody else that was preventing them, but nobody else left that area after we had sealed it off. And um, <clears throat> then the, the mission uh, was to uh, patrol up into the foothill, foothills of the Vosges Mountains, and that meant going out mostly every night. and. Uh, uh, one squad patrol that one squad for us would be maybe eight maybe be seven it just depend upon how many we had because uh, I was in an anti-tank platoon and the anti-tank platoon is not like a rifle platoon we're only 29 people when we're full strength and um, that's a gun crew for each weapon so, but they used to utilize us the same as they would uh, an infantry platoon many a time. They had 48 people. So we would go out uh, up into the hills and at nighttime, and sometimes 
we were lucky the, not to run into a patrol, if you want to, you know, a German patrol, because there were some that were trying to infiltrate out. Some of them were, were ready to give up, but most of the time if they're ready to give up. They came down during the daytime, but the, the first night they tried to come down in our particular area, and um, they didn't make it. So um, this went on f up until about the 5th of February. And um, there wasn't much for us to do during the daytime. We were living down in the town itself, right in the heart of the town almost. So and we had been billeted in a what had been probably some German official home because all, all of their clothing, everything was still there. And it was a fairly nice apartment, but, you know, so it made it nice for us, you know. So. It, in that, instead of sleeping on the bare floor, you slept on a rug, you know, with seat cushions, uh, you know, from the chairs and things like that, which they had a habit of doing uh, in furnishing the, the house, you know, with a lot of cushions around and so forth. And we, uh, we only then stayed a, a short time, but uh, enough to run into uh, French Moroccan soldiers and traded off um, uh, our rations for their sardines that they had, you know, and that was a treat, sort of, you know, to, and they, they wanted our rations and of course, you know, always, always cigarettes and things like that, you know. And, but we, you know, picked up some, um, they seemed to be have, having had a, a good number of bottles of wine with them, <laughs> we always, you know. Always. You know, and the French and so forth, but, and they were willing to part with it. I mean, as if we had something to trade, you know. That, and um, they're very, they were very interesting in that the way they operated, mostly at I, at night. You had to be careful, you know, that you didn't run into them at night. Uh, you had to hope you know, that they would recognize you and so forth. Uh, if you were on the ground. You, a lot of times you wouldn't know that they were there, but of course they would crawl up, and the next thing you know, you might hear, okay, Joe, which meant that he touched the buckles on your shoes, on your boots, because the Germans didn't have buckles on their boots. So if they didn't feel a buckle, I mean, that was the end of you. But if they, <laughs> if they, if they knew what the the GI buckles uh, felt like on the boots, and then they would crawl off in the night. But all you heard was, okay, Joe, and they were gone, you know. So, you know, that, that was interesting. How did, you, um, how did you handle the stress during those times? I mean, that's got to be anxiety-ridden. Uh, I don't know. I don't know whether we really felt it uh, as stress. It was always, um, I think it was more stressful going out, getting, you know, ready, you know, to do whatever you were supposed to do. And then, you know, once you got more into the, the mission, you know, it's more that you were, you were zeroed. You were zeroed in your mind and so forth. And keeping in touch with who was around you, I mean, just by sight. And uh, your mind was really taken off as far as I was concerned, I mean, of, of, uh, of stress. You didn't know it until you were returning and nothing else was going on, you know, and that you accomplished your mission for, for that night and so forth. And of course, I guess, maybe it was capable of handling if that was stress, then you're probably capable of handling the stress a little bit better because now you knew you were coming back to your little apartment and uh, maybe uh, heat up uh, uh, some coffee or cocoa or a biscuit or maybe a bottle of cognac, you know. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, it's, you know, it was the same way all the time. I mean, it, uh, there were. There was occasions when um, 
It sounded like it was going to be, because you didn't arrive in the sector yet, but it sounded like that there, it was a, a real good show going on in, uh, in, in that a, a town was not being taken uh, too easily. And, uh, you know, I think a little more about that one coming up, because you could see things burning, you could see the houses, you know, going up, and you could see point-blank direct fire going on, and, um, you know, you had to prepare yourself and go into this thing, and then the next thing you know, the, the word came down the road, well, you know, we were probably just on the side of the road, just waiting because you were just out of range of everything else that had been going on, and then it was like called in, and you got up and you went in. I mean, that was like uh, the unknown, you know, all the time uh, to me. What at the book, you know, the other side of time, and and the troops entering through the smoke, you know, they were going into the unknown sort of thing. Uh, knowing what you would do, pretty good idea how you would react, depending upon the situation. And of course, that all had to be a uh, split second thing. I mean, this is what's going on, this is what you do. And people knew how to dovetail one another in, in a team if that was necessary. You, you saw this, this happen here, or you, you moved away from it, you tried to get under, or whatever, over, in between. The order, the order might have been, you know, clear the houses. It meant going in there and, and clearing them, that's all. Whoever was there was there. And uh, hope that you weren't going to re receive too much fire. You didn't know when it was going to happen, or how it was going to happen, or if there was a sniper in the place and down the block or things like that, you never know. And then there was, could be incoming mortar fire in the street and everybody would try to get out from from Honda and then picked up as soon as it lifted you know and you and you moved on you pushed on it was always always forward you know was the um, um, not the password uh, uh, it, it's, it's the doctrine sort of thing always forward and that's what leadership had to do and always keep in their mind you know it's, it uh, never bogged down if you don't have to uh, keep moving and of course you had to be prepared if um, you know uh, a sergeant you know was wounded or eliminated and uh, uh, a corporal all of a sudden was taken out of the picture I mean generally the, Everybody knew who the next senior man was. If um, somebody did not have the, uh, I don't know what you would say, the presence of mind, uh, you know, to pick it up, somebody else w would say, okay, you know, follow me. <clears throat> and um, after that, we, we came back... Uh, I think we came back to Loonville. I always get them mixed up between St. of Ole and Loonville. And we were back then under, I think in place in reserve under Shafe um, Army Headquarters. We were in Theater Army Reserve, which meant we weren't in uh, direct supervision of 7th Army. Um, we were under, we'll put it this way, General Eisenhower's command. And he always had a division, two or three divisions in reserve. And that's just following doctrine, you know, where uh, a battalion would always keep a company in reserve. You know, a division would always keep another whole battalion in reserve. The, the thing was always two up and one back. So we're playing Army and Corps, so we have whatever is up on the line, and he has whatever he, he needs, but he figures what if he gets a, a hurry call on something from an um, Army commander, he has a whole division to say, okay, 
shoot them down there. So we were staying uh, within close proximity of um, the actual activity, and it wound up that um, we were kept out of the line for almost, I guess it was two weeks at that time. The division artillery never left a firing mission, though, but the, the infantry organizations were were off the line. The tank battalions were pretty much off the line. And there again, the order might be to go out, you know, and block uh, main intersections. And this meant that um, could be a way out in a, in a uh, desolate area when you know what the west is like. I mean, a road goes this way, another one goes that way, but you don't see anything, you know, for, and that's the way this was. And we take a whole platoon out, take the track out, and um, keep the track parked a, a pretty good distance from the intersection and set the gun up almost at the intersection. And then the squad would just stand by, you know, around it and, and pull like a two hour tour of doing that. And then another squad would come down and relieve you and then you could go back to the track and we went back to the track we had the canvas on and it was zipped up and in there we had um, a little stove a gasoline stove you know like you use in a camping you know the Coleman stove and we or somebody that was back well a driver was was generally back with the track and uh, he might have it going you know and and uh, hot water and uh, then you could you know warm up because it's pretty cold at this point we move now from the south a bit north not too much but enough that you were going back with uh, some snow on the ground and and it was cold and um, a lot of some nights a lot of wind blowing through so and you were wearing you know everything you could pra practically get your hands on you know to stay warm <clears throat> and it's because the, when you were in the track, the the steel floor of the track, you know, was ice cold, and it came right through, you know. So you're always banging your boots, you know, and so forth, and playing a tap dance there. So, but at least you were, felt that you were in out of the the elements, you know, uh -huh. going on, and then that would go on all night until you could uh, go back to the, uh, the French barracks that we were living in at that time. Okay. Why don't we go ahead and stop now and put a new tape in, since we've run out of tape on this one. <laughs>